Just what, when you tell, name an animal that's loyal. Dogs. Dogs, yeah, that's a go-to. What do we mean by a dog being loyal? They stay by your side. Yeah, they're gonna stay by your side. Like, no matter what, they are going to be there for you. How many of you have ever been around your dog who's otherwise quite dumb, but like, for some reason, as soon as anyone shows any emotion, like sadness or upset, the dog, for some reason, knows and like comes and comforts you. Like my parents had this pug, which she was the dumbest fucking thing in the world. <laughs> but the moment somebody still got upset, she would come over. Unless there was food, then she'd go that way. But unless you were not, as long as there wasn't another option, she was very loving and supportive. Um, and so that's the thing. Is this, this is what we mean by loyalty: is sticking with someone or having their back. So. One thing which we often think is you should be loyal to your company to some degree. So why should you be loyal to your employer? And they hired you and you're getting paid right now. Yeah, so part of it is just like, there's this agreement of like, if they are paying you, you should respect them back. And it's almost like this Kantian sort of like, they are treating you with some degree of respect, so you should respect them back. Now, there are some people who look very skeptical over this, and I just concur that I, I feel the understanding of your skepticism and we'll come back to it. Because over time, the degree to which uh, you owe your employee loyalty seems to, or employer loyalty seems to have gone down. What's another reason, though, like that people feel uh, some sort of loyalty to their employer? Or at the very least, they don't want to speak out against their employer. Yeah, one thing is, a company doesn't want you to speak out against them. Therefore, if they do, if you do, there's a good chance they are not going to want you around anymore. And since, you know, they are paying you and you are paying your bills, you don't want to lose your job. So there's a big personal risk with whistleblowing. Um, what is another reason that some people are, like, so not everyone is super loyal to their employers. Uh, but I'm sure some of you know some people who are feel loyalty towards their employer. Those particular people, generally, why do they feel loyalty to the employer? So think about somebody you know who like loves their job and loves their boss or something like that. You've got to know maybe one person. Maybe they're a fictional character, but you know, just there's got to be someone. And why? Yeah, pers there's a sense in which. Like, the, very often when people care about their employers, it's like a smaller company where the c employers show some degree about, of care about the employees as well. So there's this back and forth sort of sense of like the, I respect you, you respect me, and therefore you're less, if that's the case, then you're more likely to stay within the company or talk within. The ways in which whistleblowing becomes more common or people feel less loyalty is when the employer isn't really showing you any loyalty. So if you're a company that you know has been laying off people all the time, people generally feel less compelled, which is one of the big worries with companies laying off lots of employees, is if you work at a company where people keep getting fired, well, what, do you, what are you worried about? Yeah, getting fired. If you're worried about getting fired, are you going to work your ass off for this company? No. And so here's this big issue. Um, so yeah, that's the thing, and this is why whistleblowing is a thing. Is one, you can get in trouble for it. Two, there are generally like plans of action in place that are supposed to work well so you don't have to blow the whistle. Um, but here's the big one. When is it okay not to be loyal? When is it okay to go outside the company, go outside this sort of chain of command? I was reading it to give an example of a woman that was the FBI, and she was like concerned about like her, her uh, I don't know, she said something, but it didn't go to the chain of command. Yeah, so here's one worry is what happens if the person, so one issue might be the person next up in line above you has more power than you. And what happens also if this person in power is a comp working, you know, you work for the CIA or the FBI? What is the worry here? Yeah, here's like, the simple fact of the matter is if a company, company or organization you're working for is in some ways, espionage or something like that, there can be a worry that you, by saying you're unhappy with the company, you presumably know a lot about the inner workings of this company, and therefore they don't want to take the chance of you, you know, uh, saying things which could lead to security issues or make them look bad. And in an extreme case, you might have to worry about your actual well-being. But more often, it's just like, if a company is powerful enough, not only will you lose your job here, like, if, if you were an employer and you got a call from the CIA that said, please don't hire this person, like, the odds are you aren't going to hire that person. Um, and so, yeah, there's this worry about if you don't want to have the whistle blown on you, 
then you are far more likely to just respond with uh, anger and re like seek revenge from it. So if you're blowing the whistle, there's a definite chance of like harm to yourself or your reputation. Um, so that's the main thing pushing in the other direction. It's just like you, by going behind the back of your employer, you are putting yourself at risk because you are literally saying, hey, person who's paying me, I don't like what you're doing and your plans aren't, like ways of me de dealing with it aren't good. So I'm literally going to go behind your back and make all the problems public. It's the same sort of sense in which people, you know, you're in a fight with your friend and then your friend goes and tells all your other friends that you're in a fight with them. People generally, you know, keep it in-house or keep the, the fighting small, that sort of thing. So, um, what's another reason why it can be wrong or can become a problem with uh, whistleblowing? Well, look at the top thing. What is the top thing? What is an NDA? Anyone know? Yeah, a non-disclosure agreement. Non-disclosure agreement. So what do we mean by a non-disclosure agreement? When you agree not to disclose. Yeah. <laughs> if you, when you get them, they're very often, at about the same time you get the code of conduct, either as part of the code of conduct or something supporting the code of conduct, is there's a non-disclosure agreement. Basically, you sign a piece of paper which says what you are and are not allowed to talk about, with whom and about what company be, uh, procedures. So why do these exist? And they're a major thing in modern tech companies. So you don't need internal information. Yeah, exactly. If you are a computer company, if you work for Microsoft, do you want your employees getting drunk and talking about the projects at a party? No. No, because probably if you are working for Microsoft, where are you? California, Silicon Valley, uh, Seattle. Who else is going to be there at this party where this person is getting drunk quite possibly? All the other tech people you don't want somebody talking about, or like the Intel processing designer, you don't want them talking about Intel property stuff at a party. And if they do, what do you want to be able to make sure happens? They get fired because you don't want somebody who's going to talk about secrets of the company because it's like a major competitive disadvantage. Uh, in the same way, if you also have to sign these things if you join a U.S. government organization. For what reason? Yeah, so like, here's, here, if you work for the CIA and you are in charge of, say, monitoring certain sorts of, uh, like, secret agents or field operators in certain parts of the world, we as a society do not want you talking about this fact at parties. Like, if you include in your dating profile, work for the CIA can tell you all about our moles in Russia. Like, that's not a good thing for the country or for the society as a whole. So that's why you have to sign these NDAs. And very often, NDAs say things like, we'll not talk about internal customer things with reporters or with this. So very often, if you're blowing a whistle, you have also broken an NDA, which is a legally binding contract in certain cases. But like for private companies, I mean it's different for the government, but for private companies, they can't, uh, an NDA isn't binding if you're blowing the whistle on something illegal. Like that's the only thing, if it's something illegal, like the NDA is like already void. Like, so, so I think this is, so one thing with the government is different, but yeah, with private companies, if the NDA is, if the company is doing something illegal, you can break your NDA. But what do you do in a case where the company isn't technically doing something illegal, they're rather doing something like recording your Alexa and going to a room. Here's a case in which the people who reported this were actual whistleblowers. They were private contractors working in these uh, call houses who were like, we don't like the fact that nobody who's using an Alexa knows that they're being listened in on, so let's go talk to reporters and let them know the situation. And so here's a case in which this is, like, if a company is doing something illegal and it's like a major moral problem and you blow the whistle on them, then the, you're not going to get in like any legal trouble. But if you sign an NDA and then you whistle blow this sort of thing, you can get in legal trouble. Because even if you think like no company should be listening in to my everyday activities without me knowing the extent to which they're doing this or giving me the option to use the product without doing this, uh, because that's another big issue is like when you agreed to use Alexa, if you say no, I won't do this, your Alexa won't work. So your options are basically agree to whatever their definition of respect privacy is or don't use Alexa. And while with Alexa you can kind of get by, 
other sorts of technology are so vital to competing with other people and doing well in school and getting in touch with people that it's almost like your options are not use the product and be at a major disadvantage compared to everyone else in your society or accept their conditions. And so if you call them out on this, you can sometimes be breaking the law by doing it because you signed an NDA. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. But and in these sorts of cases, though, people do call, uh, break their NDAs for the reason of it being a major moral concern to them. And what it comes down to is there's not a, the book tries to give these nice, clear cut, like, here's when you should blow the whistle. Here's when you must blow the whistle. Here's when you can blow the whistle. But what it really comes down to is, like, there isn't a clear answer when whistleblowing is the right thing to do. But you might run into a time in which it comes up for you. And just being aware of them, like what is going on and why these issues exist is something worth thinking about before you ever get to the point of blowing the whistle. Um, who's the most famous? Name some famous whistleblowers. Uh, Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. Yeah, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, uh, Bradley, now Chelsea Manning, um, Deep Throat, uh, who was the name, like the code name given to the guy who blew open the Watergate scandal with Nixon. Uh, so these are people who went outside to reporters and published classified or secret information, which then went public and caused a major uh, public uproar. And that's the basic idea of whistleblowing. Is if the internal company's not going to call it out, and there's technically not anything legally that you can do, or the legal institutions also have a reason to keep it quiet, um, then the idea is you go to the public and make sure that they know directly. Okay, you got a hand. Uh, is there a time period on the NDA or not? I don't know. My guess is it depends on the NDA. Uh, I know that like certain NDAs seem to be uh, like pretty permanent. Um, so like uh, I was reading about I think we mentioned Harvey Weinstein last class, and one of the reasons why the, the stories stayed quiet for so many years is when people left the company, they had to sign an NDA which said they would never talk about anything that happened in the company. And women were only, uh, like because they had signed this NDA and didn't want to break the law, it was only when there was this major influx and the public news and many people were able to do it together at the same time, such because if one person does it, they're almost certainly going to get sued. But as soon as a large enough group of people are doing it together, it becomes much harder to sue them. But this woman basically, she didn't break her NDA for tw until like 20 years later. And so it was still operative 20 years later. Um, so it really, I think, depends on the company and the, the stuff. And I, my guess is there's also a sort of element of like, if you in like the 1990s worked on a company that uh, has since gone bankrupt because all your company did was work on pagers, and since the pager is no longer used, and like, except in like some doctor's offices, uh, you could probably talk about that and not get in trouble because nobody's going to care that you're talking about the inner workings of a pager. Um, do people even know what I mean by a pager? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, so it really depends. Um, all right. So is everyone on board with whistleblowing and NDAs and that sort of? And so this, it's really just a, a problem that you might run into and you will come across in the news. And you can see the Edward Snowden case. So what did Edward Snowden do exactly? Anyone? Any takers on exactly what he did? Okay. Uh, he reported the phone calls being recorded in Saudi Arabia and uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah, it was basically the U.S. government had policies in place to do a lot of data collection. Some of them were audio recordings, others were just collecting um, metadata, so basically all the data from Verizon and AT&T of what numbers were calling what numbers, um, and how long the calls were, and that sort of thing. And they were using this information uh, and giving it to the government without the consumers knowing that any of this. So it was basically, he just took all this information and published it on WikiLeaks. Uh, and then it basically split into two main camps, the people who thought, oh, this person is a hero because he showed us that our government is listening to us. And the other people who said, oh, this man is a traitor because he was a government contractor who then went behind the backs of the government and shared classified information. So that's really like a clear case of what on earth and why whistleblowing such a problem. Because no matter who you are, if you go against your company or your uh, government or something like that, somebody's going to get really pissed off. Um, all right. Any questions here? We good? All right. Oh, I know why everyone's looking extra sleepy. 
development on dry land. And I didn't, that was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Those are pathetic. Alright, so um, that's our first bit. So now, this, for the final half hour or however long this takes, we're going to talk over here which is the other main issue I want to talk about from this professional ethics class, which is one that I personally find a lot more interesting than the codes of conduct. And also, I find whistleblowing very interesting, but I find this even more because it's just like a classic philosophical how do you wrap your head around this problem sort of thing. So, here's how we're getting into it. How do you keep the society orderly? It's a very vague general question. We live in a society. Why do you want your society to be orderly, first off? Yeah, you don't want chaos because what happens when things get chaotic? Shit hits the fan. Right? Shit hits the fan, and when shit hits the fan, what happens? People get hurt. And I don't know about you all, but I don't enjoy getting physically harmed and having my things taken. Um, so that's how it is. So that's why we want to keep society orderly. So how do you keep society orderly? Did you okay? Me? Yeah. I was thinking. It can be hypothetical or just general or yes. Yeah, so communism, and so what is communism for those of, everyone's heard the word, but what does it actually mean? Anyone know? You don't have private property and everyone gets the same thing. Yeah, so what you do is you take any stuff that's made, you put it in a big pot, and then you split it evenly. And the idea behind communism is, uh, well, why, why did the theorists who thought communism would work, why did they think it was going to work? Everyone's equal, and one of the main ways in which like, damage and harm comes about in a society is often because of inequality. <laughs> so, um, the people who are, think about like a mugging or something like that. Usually when somebody mugs somebody else to take money, why do they do that? They don't have money or they're desperate. If everyone had the same amount of money, there'd be much less of an incentive to take things from each other. So, here's one way. You just put in place these systems that m reduce the amounts of violence and the amounts of, uh, like, health issues. Another thing is, like, why people are pushing for um, equality in health care is just that a society where less people are sick is a society in which more people can work, less people have to spend money at the doctor, more people, like doctors' offices are less crowded, just society in general, if everyone was able to go to the doctor when they needed to, then you would have fewer catastrophic health issues, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the idea behind communism. But generally, what you see is just ways of keeping down, like, violence or economic, like, extreme economic inequality and keeping most, like, trying to reduce poverty and that sort of thing. And so all of this is just a matter of, um, you know, you keep it orderly by putting practices in place to keep violence things out. What are other ways, though, of not necessarily going as, as extreme as giving up all private property? In this society, how, what are some other ways in which you keep society orderly? Socialism. So socialism is another one of these big picture general sorts of things. But imagine like you don't even want to go that extreme of like even uh, changing laws or anything that fancy. What are some things we have in place right now? You have like laws and police. Yeah, laws and police. You have Basically, crimes are punished, is what it comes down to, is you have laws which people have to follow, and if they don't follow them, they get punished. So it's just a matter of, you know, criminal justice is one of the main ways we keep things under control. So, in criminal justice, if you do something wrong, you get punished. Simple as that. Oh, they turn up in brightness. That helps. Um, all right, so, or just more simply, Crime and punishment. So that's the answer to number one. So the question number two is how do we decide who to punish and how to do so? So how do you decide who gets punished and how to punish them? And I don't mean just like the, the actual practical sense that you go to a jury or you go to a judge. I mean like why does the judge make the decision they do or why does the jury decide whether this person should be punished in this way or that way. Like, depending on how severe the crime was. Yeah, so part of it is, it's a matter of how severe the crime is, is basically it. So, if I told you that in our, our new society, um, if you commit robbery above 12 cents, you get your hands cut off. 
Why does this woman punishment seem not great? Well, get their yeah, it seems a little too extreme. We don't want the we, the punishment has to fit the crime. Or like, what if you found out that um, this is actually a policy which I have thought about way too often. What punishment should somebody get if they attempt to get onto the subway before they've let anyone else off of the subway? <laughs> um, so this is a, pr a policy where we can imagine society would be much better ordered if there was like some sort of policy preventing people from, you know, wait your damn turn. Like, let everybody off and then get on and everything would be better. And this is a special, there are certain sorts of things where like, you can really tell whether someone's a New Yorker based on how mad they get about certain types of things. <laughs> and one of them is definitely people on subways. Yeah. Like, talk to somebody else and they're like, eh, yeah, I guess I understand. But you talk to a New Yorker and it's just like pure <laughs> rage about these people who get on. Like, I, I I body check just about everybody who's trying to get on. Like, children, they have to be taught early. Uh, you just gotta make sure they learn quickly. And if your child gets checked, then you should have been watching them closely. Um, I draw the line at pregnant ladies. Uh, I, I'm not gonna check a pregnant lady. Um, and I've started to reconsider my views on the elderly. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's the sort of thing. It has to do with. Uh, how do we decide and how do we punish that? It's a matter of how... That's not how you spell bad. Bad is the crime. So how do you decide how bad a crime is? There's really two things that go into it. Yeah, so what is the effect? So, why is murder worse than, um, I don't know, thievery? Like, yeah, taking some, killing someone is worse than stealing their stuff, generally. Uh, why is uh, murder worse than jaywalking? And I don't mean like going up onto the beautiful roof area. Oh. Why is murder worse than crossing the street not at a crosswalk? Uh, nobody dies when you cross the street, except, well, you might get hit by a car. <laughs> yeah, you might get hit by a car, and maybe the car will hit you, and maybe they'll get there, but it's not like a guaranteed death. But what else goes into how bad is the crime? <coughs> uh, when somebody goes is on trial for murder, are they just on trial for murder? What are they on trial for? Uh, that's in the felony. A felony and what what sorts of degree? First, yeah, there's a degree element. So what does it mean to commit murder in the first degree? Like premeditated, like no no legal justification. Yeah, you planned it out and you carried it out and you killed this person. What is the difference between that and like second and third degree murders? They just kill them probably without trying or without meaning to. So, so the five, so the way it works is you've got first, which I that's premeditated, you plan it all out, and then down here you've got manslaughter, which is you kill someone but you didn't mean to. So, like if you um you get in a car crash where like you uh you're part of the car or like you didn't take the car into the shop quite as recently as it needed to or the car